I welcome I welcome every one of us to tonight's meeting. I pray the Lord will continue to minister to us. Let us quickly pray. Heavenly Father, we say thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you for what you're about to do in our midst tonight. Holy Spirit, we invite you to take control. Holy Spirit, take control. Let your presence be tangible. Lord, as your speaker speak tonight, open our eyes of understanding. Open our eyes to see beyond, beyond, beyond what we hear. Let our eyes begin to see further, 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 and further, deeper into your mind. Open our ears to begin to hear clearly, clearly, clearly. Every manipulation of darkness, every satanic agenda, be arrested, be arrested, be arrested, be arrested. Father, let your name alone be exalted, O oh God. Holy Spirit, have your will, Lord. Holy Spirit, visit us tonight like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, in Jesus' name. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to believe everyone can hear me. Thank you so much, Uncle Taiwo. I appreciate this opportunity and um, privilege to be able to minister once again on this platform. And I pray for every one of us that as we begin to open our hearts to the Lord, towards his word and instruction, that the Lord himself will breathe upon us in the name of Jesus. Once again, I welcome each and every one of us. So on today, um, uh, we'll be talking on a topic. It's just three letter words that we'll be talking on. And I pray the Lord himself will interpret his word to us and make it come alive upon us in the name of Jesus. So the topic that we'll be talking on, you know, when Uncle Taiwo reached out to me yesterday, and in the course of the night, the Lord had to like minister this word to my heart. And just like Uncle Tai would say, before any word come out to people, let it, you know, reach to you first. And I'm bringing this word out of the, the richness of God, you know, for our life, for our destiny, you know, much more than whatsoever that we are doing, much more than whatsoever that we have achieved. There's still much more that God wants us to know. And that word is sin, sin, S-I-N. I want to believe that this is not something that is new. It's not a word that is new to us, but there's something God wants us to see and there's something God wants us to know in this topic. So we'll be talking about sin. And if we look at it, basically everyone knows that when we talk about sin, it has to do with disobedience, whatsoever they are doing, that is not what pleasing God. But something God said to me that sin itself is um simple instruction neglected. That's S I N simple instruction that what that is neglected. And we'll be looking at it from what from Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. How sin or what you know, how we started, what was the basis? You know, why do we say this is sin or how do we come about the word sin? So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, it says, okay, I'll read from verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, Except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. And you know, when the word of God comes to a man that you are sure to die, this is what is going to happen. That is what is going to happen. So we can see here that what the Lord God, the first thing he did was to place a man in the garden. When the Lord God place you, trust me, the next thing is instruction. The Lord does not place a man and just leave the man to do things on his own because he knows that the man may not have what understanding on what to do. For every man that has been placed into a garden or in any what sect of life, you know, the Lord is going to what bet you, he's going to give you a certain instruction. And once this instruction is neglected, that is sin. It may look small. It may not even be general to everyone. But once an instruction that God has given to you, once you neglect it, then it becomes sin. 
And something the Lord said to me in the course of preparing this um, ministration last night, he said to me that, do you know that sin, you know, just like I said, S-I-N, we'll be dealing mainly with acronyms. I mean, I'll be going back and forth with the word S-I-N, S-I-N. So sin also, when we look at it, it is sweet in nature. There is no one here today, you know, when you look at sin itself, do you want to talk of anger? Do you want to talk of pride, fornication, adultery? Sin is sweet in nature. When you want to exhibit it, when it's looking as if you want to, you know, do what you I mean, what you desire, you know, it's like a satisfaction, it gratification. It's very sweet. That's the nature of sin. But one thing that we should know today about sin is this. When we look backwards, you know, if you, me, I'm someone that I love words and acronyms so much. So backwards, the sin is N M N I S, and God said to me, it is what a net in shape. The sin that is sweet in nature, but behind it is actually a net. And what is a net? A net is what something that you use to catch a prey. If you go to, you know, the fishermen, you know, that is what they used to catch fishes. The same thing that what the sin is, is a net, is a trap. It may be sweet today. It may appear good before you. It may look as if, yes, you are enjoying it. But in, in actual sense, it's actually is what a net that is set to trap you, that is set to what, to cage, that is set to enslave. You know, back home, if you wanted to, you know, catch rats. Then I remember my dad, there's this kind of trap. I don't know if, you know, I'm sure maybe Uncle Taiwan that any might know about it. There's this kind of trap that you just put a little maybe bread or fish in the, in the piece of that, what's that trap. Any rat that is coming, maybe they smell it. Once they step on that trap, it's going to catch them. You know, why? Because what? That is the word. That is the aim. Mm -hmm. The aim of sin is to what? Is to trap. The aim of sin is to enslave. There is no purpose. There is nothing more that sin wants to do. It wants to enslave a man. It wants to trap a man. And that is why I said it's a net in shape. You may not see it, but its actual shape is what is net in shape. So one thing I want us to know also, you know, when God has already given to Adam and Eve, he has given them the instruction on what to do. And they decide to what, you know, do what they want to do. Because the only way that a man will enter, that a man will what, get into sin, is when you desire yourself, when you desire your want, your own gratification above God. Go and check anyone today, or check any man. You know what? That is living in sin. The man desires his want, his, his own what desire. He desires what his own lust. He, de um, he desires what he wants for himself. He desires himself much more than God. And we'll see it in Genesis, Genesis chapter three, verse four. I'll read from verse four to six because of our time. I'm trying to cut it. You know, he said, you won't die. Imagine God have told, you know what, them that they are going to die. Now devil is telling them, you won't die. Don't forget the last part we read was you will surely die. Now there is another person now saying you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. Hear this. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. She wanted what were that fruit. What God told them not to do. She wanted what is going to give to her. She wanted what is going to be for her. Now, whenever a man desires, you know what, anything for you, I mean yourself, whether it's satisf satisfaction or gratification, you're already to tending towards sin. Because what anything that has to do with you, yourself, me, it's just about me, it has nothing to do with who is instructing me. Trust me, that is a way to, what, to tend towards sin. Eve was after the wisdom. She was after what this would be for her. You know, could there be an instruction that God has given to you? Oh, don't do this. Don't do that. And you're like, no, 
let me see, there could be something much more. You know, when you tell a child not to, oh, do not open that box. The moment you tell that child, don't open the box, the child wants to see why you want and not to open the box. That is the time the child wants to know what could be inside the box. So it could be that when the Lord is telling us, don't do this, don't do that. And that is, okay, let me see, there should be more. There could be a reason why God is telling me not to do this. Why does he want me not to do what, not to live like this? Why is he telling me to dress like this? Why is he telling me there should be more to this? And in the course of you being so curious, you get trapped. In the course of you trying to figure out why, why is it? You know, the best way, so I, I learned from someone that the best way to show your love to God is just obey. You are not trying to figure out the consequence, the reason, the, how will I call it, what is going to be the what, the profit for you. That is not your concern. You just want to obey. Him. God, is this what you want me to do? Yes. I'm not trying to know, okay, God, why? You know, a lot of us, we try to like, God, why should I do this? Why shouldn't I do that? Why do you want me this? And we begin to question God over simple instruction that he has given to us. Do not eat. And that was it. It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. It's not something that, you know, that you need someone else to explain to you. It was just so simple. But the woman could not what accept it. The man could not hold on to what that simple instruction. They were looking for what? What will benefit them? What will what be a profit to them? And three things that what sin is always after. Whenever sin comes into the life of any man, whenever a man begins to live in the life of sin, three things that this what sin is after is still as I have. The first thing is your soul. Anywhere you see sin, it's aiming after a man's soul. There is no sin a man is getting into today. There is no sin a man is living today that is just, so, it's just for the fun of it. No, it had an intention, and that is your soul. The soul of a man is the priority, is the first on agenda that the word that the sin is what is after. I want us to look into Mark chapter 8. The book of Mark chapter 8, we read from verse 34. Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 38. Okay. But... If anyone is there, you can read. Okay. Then calling the crowd to join his disciple, he said, if anyone, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit? If you gain the whole world, but lose your soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? Is anyone, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, in these adulterous and sinful days, the son of man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in glory of his father with the holy angels. Praise the Lord. We can see here that Jesus will what telling his disciple, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn mm -hmm. from your words, selfish ways. And that is why I told you that whoever that is living in sin, anyone, because sin itself is selfish. It's just about you. Any man that is in sin, any man living in sin is a selfish man. Because all what you are after is just about yourself. You are after, oh, you being the first one to get the job. You are after you being the first one to talk. You are after about your right. Oh, they have to take your own decision. They have to take what you said. It's about you, you, and you. It's about what you can gain. And that is why you see that I said that, you know, what's going to be your benefit when you gain the whole world? And I say here that to gain is to the world, but to lose is to the soul. 
when you choose to gain, when you choose the world, it may seem that you are gaining. When you want to gain, when you want to have profit, you know, the word gain is a word that is used in what? In commercial setting, you know, has to do with what? It's like you what? By gaining over something or, or you want to what? Make a transaction. If we choose the world today, it may look like a gain for you. But trust me, there is something in exchange, which is your soul already. And tell me, how much of the world can you gain? How much of it can you gain? But I said here that the way the enemy traps a man's soul is by what? Gaining the world. And you wonder, how can a man gain the world? The enemy makes you gain the world in exchange or loss of your soul. You gain the world by having what is in the world. When you begin to have what is in the world and you are doing what is in the world in the world's way, in the way it is run, the way the world talks, you know, because everything, is, let's say for instance, now, even houses, cars, ambition, your academic, you know, marriage and everything, it's right here in the world. And we as Christians too, we are also partaking in it. You're getting married, you're having children, you're you know, going to school, you're aiming at what are you ground? Good. But ask yourself, are you gaining it in the way that the world gains their own? The way they are gaining marriage, the way they are gaining contract, the way they are gaining, you know what, um, how I call it, six figures, is that the same way you are gaining yours? To gain the world is not about having the whole world. But when you begin to have what is in the world, in the way, in the setting, when you are ruling the things you have in the way the world will rule their home. You know, it's just like when you dress as a Christian, everyone will dress. But how are you dressing in your own, in your own words manner? How are you living in your own manner? Whatsoever that you are doing, when it's not looking the same way the world is doing their own, that means you are gaining the world. And that's why you see all these musicians, when they want to sing, they have to sing to what? To gain the world. They have to dance to gain the world. They have to do it in the world's way. Or for me to um, sing a word and each song, or for me to, you know, really sing in the way people will accept me, I have to what? Drink as so many, I mean, alcohol, you know, just for me to be high. When you begin to do that, that is what you are gaining the world. Because you are using their word, the method, the system of the world to run the things of the world. And that is what a way of what you are exchanging your soul already. Another thing that the, what the enemy is saying is going to what, take away from your mind. Once the soul has been what, taken, has been targeted, the next thing is what? Your identity. Identity. When a man begins to entangle himself with the things of this world, such a man is going to lose his identity. You know, for instance, let's say for uh, maybe a child that you ask her, oh, do not take that bread. And the, um, the child eventually took the bread, ate the bread. Do you think the child will feel so free to come to the mother again? No. Before you know it, you just found that the child is what? Kind of reluctant. It's not, you know, cheerful. You'll be wondering, what's going on? Have you done something? You know, and that was what happened to the life of Cain. God was like, if you have done something that is good, if you did it well, I will accept you. So your identity with what will be misplaced because when you feel like there is something you've done wrong, the devil wants to steal your identity. He wants to steal who you are. When you begin to involve yourself in sin, your identity is misplaced because you are now outside, outside of the instruction. We saw it in the life of the prodigal son too. This is a son that what that had the word house. He had father. He had brother. He even had what servants at his disposal. But immediately he left the father's abode. He was seen as a slave. He was treated like a slave. The identity he had at home got lost because he's now outside. When a man begins to live outside of God's instruction, outside God's abode. Outside the kingdom, you are what? You've already sold your identity. You've lost it. Because whoever that will be seeing you outside will not see you as a child of God anymore. 
They are seeing you as a slave. They are seeing you as one that is what an hired servant. Imagine the son that has what that has a house. Now he's beginning to sit among pigs. He's beginning to feed the pigs. And that's what happened. Whenever you begin to work, live in sin. You don't see yourself among what you are not going to be in the world in control anymore of the things that your father have put in charge, you know, put you in charge of. But now you are going to be the one among pigs, dirt, among mess. That is where you're going to be. Because what the identity has been misplaced. The moment you take a step outside of the instruction, you're already taking a step outside your identity. And another thing that what Okay, I said here that Adam, just like we're talking about identity, the same thing too happens to Adam. Imagine when Adam was in the garden and God was still asking, Adam, where are you? It's not as if God did not know where he was, but he's just asking, there's a place of authority. There's a place I know you to be. There's a place I've put you. I placed you myself. Now I can't find you there. What's going on? Where are you? How can you be in the garden and yet you are missing? And that is why a lot of Christians, we can still be, oh, yes, we're in church. But God is still saying, where are you? There's a place I know I put you. There's a place I know I commune with you. I can't find you there. The place of your authority, where I can identify that this is who you are. This is my child. I can't find you there anymore. Something is wrong. You've done something. And we saw Adam, you know, when he was telling God, oh, I hid myself. The woman you gave me begin to what? Make excuses. So I want us to know that once a man begins to live in sin, your soul, your identity, and the next thing is your nature. As a child of God, one thing we should know that we are in the world, in God's family. And for everyone that is in God's family, there is what we call DNA. It runs in our blood. You know, you don't need to, you don't have to look for it. It's just there. It's natural. As a child of God, there's something that should be natural for you. That it just, it's just you. It's just, you know, it should not be something that people have to be figuring out. Oh, is this girl going to be holy? Is she going to, you know, is she kind? Is she loving? Is she caring? Is she, is she a prayerful person? You know, it's going to be natural for you because it's our nature. But devil is going to steal that once you get yourself, once we get ourselves entangled with sin, our nature. The thing that's supposed to come to us natural is going to now be like a struggle. You don't need to what tell a child, you know, of what, let me say, you don't need to tell a puppy to start barking. They will just bark. Because that's just the way puppies, the dog, you know, the family, they're just going to what? They're just going to bark. It's now going to be a thing of concern when we begin to see the puppy, you know, keeping quiet, not barking. So I ask, what are those things that are natural for you before the prayer life? You know, I said here that as a Christian, you must know your what? Your ought to. Just like the word of God said that men ought Always to what? Pray. That is a sign that you are living. That is a sign to show that what? You have a DNA running inside of you. You ought to. As a Christian, you must know your ought to's. What are those things that you are you ought to do? You ought to pray. You ought to fast. You ought to evangelize. You ought to live right. You ought to be holy. You ought to this. You ought to this. When you begin to see yourself that those things that you ought to do, you're not doing them anymore. Check. It could be that what sin is locking around. It could be that there is something that what that you're what I mean, getting yourself involved with that is what stealing what your nature is not making it a struggle. It's not making you to do it freely. You are not even you know. You find it so hard to do. Maybe you are praying before. Now it's so hard to pray. And trust me, someone said that a sinning man. Is the word stops praying and a praying man stops sinning. Once you are always praying, you know, with the grace of God, there is no how you will keep sinning. And once you are sinning, there is no how. Your prayer life is just going to go down. 
I'm not talking of prayer that you mumble within your heart. But you know the serious prayer when it comes to what you have in a word, real intimacy with God is just going to go down. You can't see a sinning man that is praying. No. And you cannot see a praying man that sings. And that is why we talk about what our nature, our DNA. And I want us to look into first John so that we can know what is what it is that is what is in our DNA. First John chapter three. First John chapter three, verse nine. Okay. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Why? Because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning. They can't. And that's why you should not be deceived or you should not let anyone make you feel like, oh, it's not possible. All of us, we are all sinners. Nobody can live a holy life. I, was, I met, I'm, I'm not sure if she's online right now, but I met one of our sisters, you know, when I went to, to Essex County. And she was like, oh, start to sing. So you left your home to come and read Bible here. I said, yes. What I'm trying to say is, I asked her, what do you want? If you really want God, you will chase him. You will leave everything just to go and chase God. You can't. Those who are born into God's family, they can't keep on sinning. Don't let anyone make you feel like, oh, you can't be holy. And I told her something. If we cannot be holy, if we cannot, you know, be like Christ, why then do God want us to be holy? Why then do Christ have to die for us to have his life if we can't? Paul said something. It's no longer hide that live, but Christ. So you should always have that consciousness that now you are in Christ. Christ lives in you. And now you are in God's family. You can no longer sin. You can't keep on sinning. It's no part of you anymore. That could be the life before, but not anymore that we are in Christ now. We cannot keep sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God. We can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. How do we know that? Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not love, does not belong to God. It's as simple as that. The word of God is not complicated. It's so basic, simple, and plain that you can know what it's talking about. Once so, and whenever you see a man that is not living righteously, then you can say, no, this one does not belong to God. It doesn't matter the title. It doesn't matter how tongue speaking the person is if you are not living rightly if you're not living you know rightly before god you do not belong to god you don't and you don't a child of god is that person you know i know at least maybe if not twice or three times i should have been in uncle taiwo's house you know i know for the time that I was there i was sad right you see that woman comes, oh, you want to eat rice, you want to drink this, or sometimes they even give me privilege, you know, just help yourself. And I don't think the time I went to their house, I was ever drunk with alcohol. No. And I know without my beloved, how is that going to be possible with drunk in my <laughs> drunk in my house when I don't have alcohol? Of course, I can never be drunk. Even if I desire to be drunk, I just want to, you know, be that. I want to just be drunk. If at all it's going to happen, it's not going to be in Uncle Taiwo's house. That means I will have to go maybe to a bar or go somewhere that I can find alcohol. So what am I trying to say in essence? When you are in Christ, there are just some things that you cannot do. It's not going to be possible because you can't find it. I could not get drunk because I could not find any alcohol in Uncle Taiwo's house that could make me get drunk. If I have to get drunk, I have to go outside. So if you if you see a person in Christ, there are some things that the person just cannot do. It's not, it's not going to be possible. But once that person begins to do some certain things, 
you can tell that no, this person has gone outside. This person has stepped out. This person has left the abode. Just like the prodigal son, we could see it in him. The things he could not do, the things he was not doing, he was not with pigs before. He was not feeding, he was not, inside, he was not living a life of slave. But because now that is outside, that is what, what slave is, that is what people that are outside, that is what they do. And that was what happened to him. He began to live that kind of life because what now is outside. Whenever a man is outside of Christ, the nature, the things that what that he is supposed to be doing naturally is no more there. And you'll be wondering, oh, this person used to be like this before. What happened? You know, someone has once stepped out. Let's look ourselves within. Could it be that we've stepped out of our world, of our father's boundary? We've stepped out of the kingdom. And now he's making us to start being. I, re I remember then during school days, a friend of mine told my friend that, oh, whenever I don't pray, oh my goodness, it's so easy for me to know why the guy said that he will just start misbehaving. You can see me just do some things. Because with the place of strength, the place of communion, the place of what, you know, breath, you know what, he didn't go there. And that is why it's going to be so easy to know that, oh, this person. And that is, you know, what he, when he begins to notice that he felt more, it's a must I ought to pray. Not because I feel like praying. I just have to keep praying because I know that what is going to make me misbehave. I'm just going to start behaving in the ways that I'm not supposed to. So I said three ways a man will be tested because trust me, when sin comes to a man's life, like I said, it's a trap. And trap is actually, you know, like I said, I used to look at those rights. Whenever my daddy puts those traps, the reason why we put the trap is to catch those rats. Now we are testing them to see if they are going to eat the food that we put in the mouth of that trap. So also sin, whenever it comes, is testing you. It wants to see if you are going to what eat what these things, if you are going to what fall into this trap. If the thing is bringing to you, you're going to fall for it. And what are those words tests that you are going to what a man, every man will be tested with? The first thing is your what appetite. We saw it in the life of Jesus. Despite the fact that he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the first thing that was tested was his appetite. A man will definitely be tested. And that was why it happened to Adam too. They were tested. Because trust me, if Adam or he, if they have not been eyeing that word, that, why is God telling us not to do this now? If they've not been eyeing it, trust me, devil will not come to life. Oh, do you think you're going to die? Did God really say you will die? Because a man is actually tempted with his appetite. What I don't love now, no matter what, you can't tempt him with it. No matter how much you put a snail, frowns, lobster, no matter how you garnish it, you cannot test, you can't tempt me with it. I will never eat it. Because I know what it does to me. If I eat it, I begin to what, throw up. So I don't even go, I don't even I don't even smell it. But once if you have to bring Gary and Granot in front of this girl, ah, I will have to pray <laughs> because I know that's something I want I like so much. For someone else, it might not be. So what is your own appetite? Set yourself. Devil is going to bring it to you. Oh, he's going to, he will do just that. He's going to do it. And I pray. I pray for us that the Lord help us that no matter how hungry we are in the face of temptation, we will not fall for our word, for our appetite. Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't. He, he could have. In fact, he should. Because trust me, 40 days and 40 nights is not something that was a child's play. But he knew what is going to be the end of what of him falling into it. After his appetite was tested, also his integrity, because of time I'm trying not to, but we can look into Luke chapter 4. We know about the story of how Jesus Christ was taken into the wilderness, you know, and was what tempted by the devil. The integrity of every man will be tested. And what is integrity? What you stand for, whether people are there or people are not watching. Your integrity will be tested. As a female um, child, as a male child, at work, your integrity will be tested. 
Okay, look for instance now. When I mean integrity, you know, even when it comes to instruction of God telling you, do this, don't do this. Like on Sunday, for those that were not around, you know, I had a testimony to share, right? But God was saying, no, do not share that one. This is the one I want you to share. And to the glory of God, I had to go and do it, share that testimony, and just let people know about it. Or let me even say the testimony. It was about me actually trying to share a word, a video. And before I knew it, a pornographic site you know, just came up and everything. Trust me, I was the only one in the room. Nobody knew what I was doing. But integrity will tell me, is this what I really do? When I'm outside, I'm going to tell people I don't watch pornography. I've never watched it. Now I am in the what? Closed door. No one is seeing me. At least no one. Only God. So tell me what's going to be my integrity at that point when I'm in a place where no one is watching. Do I really want to watch that pornography? I could give myself, in fact, excuses came for me. Oh, your husband is not around. He's been away for a while. You can use this. You can use that. What is your integrity? What are you going to hold on to when what you are faced with what a situation that wants to what, see if truly you will stand for what you would believe, whether people would believe you or not. When devil brought all the glory, oh, look at all this. You know, in the face of glories, can you still maintain your integrity? Look at the life of Joseph. Like I do say, <laughs> for that kind of a boy at 17, a woman coming to you, that is the time, you know, at that age, he is agile, he is strong. So you have everything that it takes to go down with the woman. But integrity will never allow what Joseph do it. He had that what mind of God. He knows this is not what we do in the family. How could it be heard that I'm sleeping with my boss wife when I know that we don't do this? Integrity, you will be tested with it anywhere, wherever you are. And immediately I shared the testimony when I was going back to my set. One of my, you know, the children that, you know, the Lord helped me to know what, you know, just, you know, take care of. And he said to me, Mommy T, you are great. I had to hug the boy and I'm like, thank you. When you obey God, there's nothing that makes a great man than obedience. You might have everything in life. If you don't obey God, there's nothing great about you. There's nothing to celebrate a man that is what disobedient to God. Don't celebrate a man that is in the... And it's so unfortunate that a lot of people are in disobedience. We still celebrate them. You don't celebrate a man that is disobedient to God. God is going to what, you know, be asking for our word, for our obedience. That's the way to love him. There's no how you can show to God that you love him than what obeying him. And the last one that you'll be tested with is your identity. This same identity that devil has come to steal is the same that what is still going to test us with. You know, devil was telling Jesus, if you are a son of what? Of God. We want to know who you are. I know I was telling the sister that I met today, you know, at SS County, every situation that comes to us, whether good or bad, is only asking you, who are you? Are you a child of God? When you are faced in the, in the, in the, in the words, in the scene of what, fornication or adultery, or even changing figures, in the scene of what, showing that what, yes, you can talk, pride, that sin, I mean, that situation is only asking for your identity. Will you tell us who you are? Are you truly a child of God? When people are getting to a place of work, you know, 10 o'clock and they are writing 6 o'clock, will you tell us who you are? Can you tell us the truth that you are a child of God? When people are out there, you know, messing themselves up, doing all sorts of things. Can you tell us that you are a child of God? As a wife, can you tell us you are a child of God? As well as husband, as a father, can we see that you are a child of God? Even as a worker in church. We've seen workers in church that you wonder, sister, why are you acting like this? We thought you are a watcher, a believer. Can you tell us you are a child of God? If they don't give you a microphone, if they don't allow you to lead the prayer, if you are not, you know, I, 
for me, when I came into this country, trust me, I was always thinking, oh, definitely I will join the choir, I will join the choir. But even when I was in the choir in my first church and everything, even if you give me my performance, my own is my, my just, I just want to sing and just live. Let us just worship God. Let's just praise God and, you know, and the Lord be lifted. But when the identity, when the test of your identity comes to you, will you show us who you truly are? Because trust me, all this, all this will be tested. All of this will be tested for everyone. And I put it here. It's, it's only a fool that drinks a cup of pleasure. I saw it you know, on the status that a fool is a person that drinks a cup of pleasure for a sea of wrath. Maturity is you denying yourself a short-term pleasure for a long-term gain. There are so many things that come as pleasure to us today. If only we can deny ourselves. If only we can say no to those pleasures so that what we can have those words long-term gain, so that we can have the eternal life, so that we can have the words, you know, the God-given life that he wants us to have. Much more than the pleasures of this world today. What are you willing to lay down? What are you willing to give? God has come. He has sent his son to us to do or to save us from the word shame, from the guilt of sin. What are we willing to do? I was telling the sister that last week, I think that was on Tuesday that I ministered. And after the administration, I had to appreciate God. And I was just telling God, oh God, you know, I love you so much. Oh God, whatsoever you want to use me for, just do it. Just send me, just do everything. And the next thing I had that God sent me, go into um, John chapter 14, verse 15. And what does it say? If you love me, you will obey my commandment. Our only way to prove to God that we love him is to show what is to obey him. Don't try to figure out why he's asking you to do what he asks you to do. Just obey. In fact, the best way to answer God is just what? Say yes. Even before he tells you to do anything, just say yes. You don't know what it's going to say, but just say yes. Just say yes. That is a way to honor him. That is a way to show that you love him. And until we can do that, trust me, sin will always want to hold us bound. Sin will always want to hold us, hold us. But the good news is this, I would say, God will leave the 99 to find just one. No matter how much we've gone astray and it look as if have been lost. Oh, I know that this sin, you know, keeps, you know, defeating me all over and over. Trust me, that song says, no shadow it won't light up, mountain that it won't climb up to come after us. No matter who you are, no matter, you know, where you're listening from, one thing I want us to know today, that God, God is so, so interested in our life. In fact, he will leave the 99 that are what, that are saved, that are saved, just to look for one person that is what that has gone astray. That is how much the love of God is. That is how much he does not want anyone to live outside, to live in sin. No matter how much the person has gone far. Look at the prodigal son. Even though he decided, you know, in his mind to go back home, the father was still the one that ran to him when he saw the step. Just take the step to come back home. And that's what I always say to myself, to say, no matter what, don't stay outside, always come back home. It is better, it is safe to be home. Even if God is going to stroke you, I was telling my mom this night, that it is better if a child does something, it's better you come back home, let them stroke you. You know, at least once they beat you, you can still go back to your bed, you can still enter the kitchen and eat, than for you to be outside in the dark, outside in the cold, where lions, where any kind of animal can hit you up. Do not stay outside. Always come back home, no matter what. Don't let the devil interpret or give you another notion of who God is. Our God is merciful. He is always willing. Its ends are always what outstretched to receive anyone that is willing to come back home. And know this today, that whenever, just like I said, that whenever, you know, the word of the Lord said to us that we, you know, between the, um, the serpent and the woman, he said he's going to create enmity between them. 
You know, when the Lord begins to walk upon you, when the Lord begins to tell you, oh, this is what you should do, don't do this, don't do that. Once you discover your sin, once you discover what devil is trying to bring, you know, against your God-given destiny, the first thing to do is destroy it. Do not try to discuss with the devil. The word of the Lord said that what you are to crush the head of the serpent. Don't try to be discussing with devil. No. Immediately you see any kind of appearance of what he would, any kind of appearance will see. Destroy it. Destroy the thoughts. Destroy it immediately. Don't even give it, you know, mm, let me allow it sleep. I will think over it. No. You give devil the size of a pain hole. Trust me, he's going to maximize it. I know that he, he's going to maximize it. So once you see the appearance in any form, in any way, just destroy it. Through the word of God, through prayer, through fasting. Through fasting. Through fasting. Because there are some things that will never just leave you like that. You need to fast. If you need to agree with a brother or a sister in Christ, do so. Your soul is much more important to God than any pleasure that the enemy is bringing. Do so and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And also, one thing I want us to know, lastly, the way to help ourselves, you know, as Christians, so that we don't keep falling over, over into sin is this. One thing you should know that the tool that the enemy use for sin, one, is what? It's still this S-I-N. The first thing is secret, secrecy. Because sin strive in secret. Whenever you're doing anything secret, secret, you know, you're closing the door, you're taking course, you know, just watch it. There's, there's definitely sin somewhere. I can't be in the room now to want to pick up corn. I have to pick up corn and run somewhere or hide somewhere. You know, be open. Be open. One of my spiritual fathers said something. I make sure my phone is open to everybody. Why? So that there won't be any issue of, oh, there's someone that you cannot, you know. In, in fact, you can receive his calls. So there's no somebody that is so special that, you know, nobody should receive the call or there's one message that oh, somebody should not read. There's one picture that someone should not see. Live a life that is open. Even Jesus was open to all, open to everyone. And also, idleness. Help yourself not to be idle. Just like people say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Don't be idle. Pray. Listen to messages. Get yourself work. If you found that maybe there's you're still looking for a job, you know, get yourself busy. Find something else that you can do that is what profitable in the way of the Lord. Don't be idle. Devil uses an idle mind. Devil uses anyone that is idle. Once you are idle, devil can just pick up. Look at the life of David, a king for that matter. When he was supposed to be at the battlefield, because it wasn't, that was when it was what, you know, going all around. And before you knew it, found Bathsheba, saw the nakedness. Before you know it, oh, bring her, and that's it. So you cannot what be idle, and also devil uses what nakedness. Christian, you cannot be naked. You cannot be nakedness in what in the what in the context, you know, as being naked as a sister or a brother. You can't afford to be naked. And also nakedness in terms of what you being raw. Some people, their words are not seasoned. They are too raw, you know. You need to see the way some people, talk. they are just raw in the way they talk. They are just raw. They are not refined. Let me put it that way. You need to be refined. You need to be refined. You need to be, let your words be refined. Let your actions be refined. Begin to look at yourself. Oh, is this the way I'm behaving? Refine your actions. Even the word of God says, let our words be seasoned with grace. When you begin to see the way you do your things and you know that, no, this is not it. Go refine it. Take it to the Lord. Let the Lord prune it for you. Let the Lord take away every what impurities in it so that it can what be refined. I pray the Lord God help us in the mighty name of Jesus. So I want us to talk to God 
before the devil takes over, the Lord help me, set me. That was what David said. David was hopeful. He said, set me, Lord, if there be any sin in me. It could be one thing. You know, what is a sin to me? What I'm dealing with now might not be what you're dealing with. But talk to God, the Lord, here I am, oh God. That's what I'm saying. Here I am, down on my knees, oh God. You know, surrendering it all. Is there something you are still, you know, is looking as if you can't do without or you know, it has defeated you secretly? The Lord, I want to know you more. I open myself. I surrender. I surrender to you, O God. I surrender this part of my life to you. Help me, O God. Don't, don't leave me halfway. We saw the life of the of the Jewish man, you know, that was beaten and battered. But the good Samaritan came to help. Jesus is here to help us. He's not going to leave you halfway. He's not going to leave you half dead. If only you can open to him. And he's going to place you on the strength, on his strength. And Lord, from today, place me on your strength. He placed the man on his donkey. He placed him on his strength. You cannot live, you know, the, the life of Christ yourself. You need to depend on his strength. You need to depend on his grace. That Lord God, here I am, O oh God. Strengthen me, oh God, strengthen me. Help me, Lord, whatsoever that seems to be defeating me secretly. I open up to you. Daddy, help me. I surrender to you. Help me, Lord. Help me not to be defeated. Help me, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you. Over to you, Uncle Taiwan. Thank you so much, um, our teacher tonight. I pray the Lord continue to strengthen you in Jesus' name. Um, let us pray. I want us to quickly stretch our hands, you know, or just pray, send the word of prayer to our teacher tonight that the Lord will continue to embrace her. The Lord will continue to empower her. Pray in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we say thank you for the things you have done through your daughter tonight, Lord, we make a demand that you continue to strengthen her. She will not fall. She will not fall. The enemy will not use this message against her in the name of Jesus. We pray the hand of the Lord continue to strengthen you. We pray for more grace in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we say thank you for thank you for the things you have done tonight. Thank you for the heart you have restored. Thank you for the yokes you have broken. Thank you for destinies that are being remodeled tonight. Father, let your name alone be exalted. Lord, as we go to bed tonight, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you encounter us tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, I make a decree, O God. The Bible says we shall decree a thing and it shall be established. I decree as, a, as your son. Lord, I make a pronouncement that every shame, every pain, whatsoever that we cannot share with man, whatsoever has been a burden, a yoke, a weight that has been in our lives from January to this moment, as February expires today, I command those things to expire in the name of Jesus. Let them expire in the name of Jesus. Let every shame, every wrong habit, every sin, any iniquity be broken in the name of Jesus. Be destroyed, be terminated, be terminated, be terminated. Let the newness of Christ begin to flow in our lives in the name of Jesus. I decree, let shame be removed. I decree new doors begin to open a sense of sense of purpose be reignited in the name of Jesus in our heart in the name of Jesus open our eyes of understanding Father let your name alone be exalted O God in Jesus name we pray Amen 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 in Jesus name a quick reminder once, once again that uh, the Garden of the Eagles for March is going to be March 23rd uh, please just inform your friends family and everyone around you. Thank you very much. Uh, we see you on Monday, by God's grace. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.